he said, sorry, not, not he says, but the, the Torah says, um, just then a certain Israelite man came. This is not Pinchas, sorry. This is not Pinchas. This is, this is a, what happens just before Pinchas emerges. Just then a certain Israelite man came and brought a Midianite woman over to his companions in the sight of Moses and of the whole Israelite community who were weeping at the entrance of the tent of meeting. When Pinchas, son of Elazar, son of Aaron, the priest, saw this, he left the assembly and taking a spear in his hand, he followed the Israelite man into the chamber and stabbed both of them. Yikes, the Israelite man and the woman through the belly. Then the plague against the Israelites was checked. So again, just to put this into context, um, this plague that is described is again, because the, the Israelites as a whole were told um, engage in something. It seems to be some something related to sexual promiscuity and idolatry, either all at once or not. The Midrash suggests that maybe women from the Midianite nation Kind of seduced the men and in so doing brought them into their worship or maybe the way to worship their gods was through sexual activity um it is unclear in the text exactly what's going wrong for the community as a whole um but to that right god responds by saying i'm just going to smite them all basically we see god doing this from time to time um through plague and then you know enter one particular couple, right? So we have a description of what's going on for the community as a whole. And then we enter with one particular couple, an Israelite man and a Midianite woman. And um, they come before, before Moses. It says they came, um, they came over to his companions in the sight of Moses and the whole Israelite community who were weeping at the entrance. They're weeping because they've just been um, told that they're all gonna basically perish. Um, Again, the Midrash goes to town and trying to figure out what it, what is that exactly is it that they do when they, you know, come into the sight of Moses and the whole community. Um, there is kind of some, well, from what, what happens next, it seems like there's some sexual act that's happening, right? So they're like having sex in public. Another dimension is that it's a Midianite woman. And so the, the Talmud also points out that uh, bringing a Midianite woman in front of Moses might have also been an act of kind of mockery because Moses was himself married to a Midianite woman. Sipora was Midianite. Um, and so on the one hand, the people are being persecuted because they're having relationships with Midianite women. And perhaps there are, this couple is coming before Moses to say, what's so bad about what we're doing? Like, you're also um, in a relationship with a, with a Midianite woman. So again, there's ambiguity in the text about what exactly is the grave sin. But the response is very clear. And that is that Pinchas, who is the grandson of Aaron, the high priest, okay? Um, he saw this, right? And taking a spear in hand, he followed them into the chamber and stabbed both of them, okay? Through the belly, we get like the sight of the injury as well. Now, this is a really, you know, icky, bloody, aggressive, violent act. Um, and it is perhaps surprising then to hear God's reaction to it. And that's what is in the next source here. It says, Pinchas ben Elazar ben Aaron Akohen, Heshiv et Hamati me al ben Israel, Bekan o et Kinati betoham, Velo Hiliti et ben Israel, Bekin ati. Lachen emor hineni no tenlo et friti, Hashalom. Or Shalom, and I'm going to stop there in the Hebrew and go to English. Pinchas, son of Elazar, son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the Israelites by displaying among them his passion for me, so that I did not wipe out the Israelite people in my passion. Say therefore, I grant him my pact of peace, Shalom, Brit Shalom. It shall be for him and his descendants after him a pact of priesthood for all time, because he took impassioned action for his God, thus making expiation for the Israelites. So just to pause here for a moment, there's already, I think, a very interesting, intriguing um, set of responses here. Pinchas did something that seems uncontrovertibly to be an act of violence, and the reaction to that is a pact of peace. I'm gonna leave the priesthood aside for a moment. The pact of peace, the Brit Shalom. And this itself is 
interesting and worth interrogating. Is this pact of peace a reflection somehow of Pinchas's actions? Or maybe it's an antidote to Pinchas's actions? Um, it's clearly offered in some kind of, um, with some kind of ad, 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 admiration or approbation on God's part, right? He, he did a good thing from God's perspective, right? And what did he do? He uh, displayed passion, he displayed passion for God, so that, did, so that I, God, did not wipe out the Israelite people in my passion. It's a very interesting formulation here. In demonstrating his own quote unquote passion, zeal for God, it meant that God did no longer have to demonstrate God's own zeal. In other words, uh, Pinchas's act stopped the plague in its place, turned God kind of back on God's self, turned that decree, God's own decree of destruction, right, which, which also is a violent, aggressive act, right, turned that back and, um, and Pinchas is somehow rewarded for this. So again, a lot of, a lot of questions, um, I think, emerge from this, from this story and it seems to valorize violence perhaps, and that's a really uncomfortable kind of uh, lesson, I think, for all of us readers. Um, so, what I want to do is share a few views on what this Brit Shalom is and how we might understand it. So um, Rashi says on these words at Brit Shalom, Shetehelo Brit Shalom, right? I give to him my, my covenant of peace. This means I give him my covenant that it should be to him as a covenant of peace, right? So I'm going to stop there for a moment. Suggestion here being God wasn't patting Pinchas on the back for Pinchas's own act of peacefulness or peacekeeping, but actually saying, Pinchas, you did something good because you stopped me, God, from kind of overstepping in a way. But I have to tell you that you need now to quiet it down a little bit, right? That's not the way going forward. What you did seems to be okay. And uh, FYI, the, the rabbis of the Talmud um, take up this issue of how is it okay? Isn't it itself a violation of, you know, the, a basic law of do not kill? Um, and they go to great, great, great lengths to try to circumscribe and circumscribe and circumscribe the exact nature of this um, exchange, if you will, or encounter rather, um, so that, it will, it would never be sanctioned again. It's kind of, you know, an important aside um, from a, the moral standpoint that Pinchas's act is not valorized um, in perpetuity. We are not given license to, you know, act violently for the sake of God, but only in very, 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 very circumscribed circumstances. But be that as it may, right, the point here that that Rashi seems to indicate right is that yes Pinchas is um is given the okay for that one particular act but his charge going forward is not to act in a similar vein but rather to act in more peaceful ways that God sort of recognizes that Pinchas is yes zealous for God but doesn't seem to see his own or doesn't see God's own covenant yet as a covenant that ought to be enacted with um, peaceful in peaceful ways. And so it is an invitation or even maybe its own kind of underhanded, um, you know, there's like, there's something underhanded about this. Yes, it's compliment. Thank you. You did well, but don't do it again. Right. Don't do don't do it again. You have to learn how to tweak your understanding to bring and to bring that passion into um, into a softer into softer expression. So that's Rashi's perspective on the breach alone. And um, I brought for you here 
something kind of corresponding but expansive in a slightly different way. Um, and that is the writing of the Nitziv, Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, um, whose commentary is Ha'emek Debar. And um, I included his, his dates here because I sort of wanted you to see that he's not, you know, he's sort of in the same ish time period, ish, <laughs> of, um, not so ish, of, of the Svatimet, sorry. Um, and so though I don't know that they were uh, colleagues interacting, it's just sort of interesting to imagine kind of the zeitgeist maybe. Um, in any case, all right, so he says at Briti Shalom, Berachho Bimidata Shalom, Shaloyak Pid, Veloyer Gids. My covenant of peace, what is it that God did? God blessed him with the attribute of peace that he should not become agitated or angry, that he should always be at ease and endowed with the attribute of peace. Um, I just want to add in the following that I didn't initially translate, but I'm going to right now. Um, is that the, the Nitziv here emphasizes something slightly different from at least my interpretation of Rashi. He's not just saying what you did was both right and not to be repeated, but he actually speaks to the kind of emotional uh, condition that Pinchas might be experiencing in the aftermath of his own aggression. And he says, Ubishvil kiteva hamasesha sa pinchas la harog nefesh beado, hayanoten lashir belev haregesh az, gam acharkach aval kasher hayal shem shemaim, mishum hachi baa habracha, shehe tami benacha to me data shalom. So this means that there's an acknowledgement that the Nativ says that it is the way, the nature of a human being for somebody who does something like Pinchas did to actually kill someone, it says, with his hands. It is the nature of the human being, hayanoten lashir balev haregesh az. The feeling, the aftermath of that for somebody who engages in an act of such treacherous aggression is that the feeling stays within them. Um, he doesn't specify the feeling. So is it a feeling of guilt? Is it an adrenaline? You know, it just makes space for that possibility, right? Is it um, aggression itself, right? That violence might breed more violence. Um, those are all different possibilities, but the, the Nitziv says that it's that emotional state that God wanted to address in giving him a breach shalom to say it's that emotional state that I want you to quiet down now. Right. Means in the aftermath of this act, let's take it down a notch internally. And um, let's make sure that you can inhabit this um, ease and attribute of peace, Pinchas, and not actually sit too much with this kind of explosion of passion that you experienced because it's dangerous and bad for you, basically. Okay, so that's kind of one angle. Um, and I want to take us now to the spot Emmet um, and share with you um, what he does with this Brit Shalom. And just um, one kind of linguistic word to say is that right, in Hebrew, right, the vocalization of words is put beneath the letters, right? There aren't vowels per se, there are kind of dots and lines that are put underneath the words to indicate how they ought to be pronounced. Um, and what that means is that you can have the same word with the same letters, but it could be pronounced differently and means slightly different things. They tend to be related because the roots are related, but they have different valences. And so the Svatimet points out that the word shalom if you take out the vav, some people write shalom without a vav, shin, lamed, mem, shalom, could also be read as shalem. Same letters, just different vocalization, shalem. Um, and again, these, these could, could be related concepts, but he accents the way in which shalem or shlemut is about completeness, wholeness, sense of resolve or integrity. Um, and that is how, he, that's the direction that he goes in. So now I'm going to read that. He says, "Bepasuk hineni noten lo et briti shalom, 
במדרש גדול השלום שניתן לפנחס, פירוש השלמות הוא גמר המכוון להיות האדם בא למקום המיוחד לו ונודע לו עיקר המכוון שעל זה נברא. Regarding the verse, I grant him my pact of peace. The Midrash says peace that was given to Pinchas is great for the world could not run without it. The meaning of shalom is shleimut. Right? The meaning of peace or shalom is wholeness, shleimut. He goes on to say the very telos of being a person is to arrive at a place unique to oneself and to know that for this you were created. This is shleimut. Usually a person cannot find this on their own. They need help from above. But there is a phenomenon of one who acquires their world in a moment. Kone olamo bisha'a achat is what that is in Hebrew. The meaning of this is that every person has a world unto themselves. As my teacher and elder, my grandfather, Rabbi Yitzhak Meir Alter wrote, the word ha'olam is, the world, excuse me, ha'olam is so called on account of what is hidden. Ha'elem, that's another example, right, of the words being the same, but the vocalization being different. You can say olam or you can say elem. And here they're related, but again, slightly different. Olam means world and elem means hiddenness. So he says the world is so-called on account of its hiddenness. See his writings, okay? Every person has some hiddenness and obstacle that they must remedy in the world. In accordance with their fixing or tikkun of this hiddenness, do they merit to reveal the hidden light? This is the struggle of the human being all the days of our lives. But Pinchas, through his self-sacrifice, immediately remedied his whole world and thus arrived at wholeness or completion. Okay, I'm gonna take a breath there. Um, I'll leave this on the screen for a moment and then I think I'll come off so we can chat in a few. But um, what is being suggested here, right, is not so much that Pinchas was gifted shalom or peace, but rather that God was in this moment after this very big event saying to Pinchas, aha, you have now manifested shlemut. You have manifested some sense of wholeness or completion. I want to, um, and I know this is morally suspect, but if we could bracket for a moment um, the, the, the violence of Pinchas, Pinchas's act and instead just think about what it could mean for a person to kind of come into their own on a dime. That's something about a situation allows a person to step up or step into a role that might not otherwise have been available and was only perhaps right in that moment. Maybe it's not right afterwards, but something happened that clarified a sense of mission. And that person in that moment is in the language of the Talmud, kone olamo bisha achat. They kind of render their world, they acquire literally their world in one moment. Um, and in the context, which we may or may not see together today, of the Talmud from which this phrase is lifted, kone olamo b'sha'achat, in that context, it's referring to the world to come and not this world. It's saying that somebody did something that, you know, they, essentially they, they repented and in a moment, they were able to kind of win back or win a place in the world to come as opposed to going through a very long process of repentance or transformation. But the Svet Emet here is not reading it about the world to come, but actually in this world, that there are moments where we all of a sudden have real kind of ownership of ourselves, real clarity about who we need to be and what we need to do. And that's what this Pinchas moment was about. It was about Shlemut. Um, I think that that is a, again, a very different message. Ignores for the moment what it means to find completion through an act that seems so 
uh, violent, right? Um, but the idea that there might be some occasions in life that call you into your better self, that place before you absolute clarity of what is needed in this moment and in that way to truly, again, kind of come into one's own, I think is an idea um, certainly that, that I can relate to. Um, and I, I, I wonder perhaps if, if you could too. Um, because this is what the uh, this is what the Svetimet is suggesting. Now he says that this is a the process of kind of discernment of discerning who and what one needs to be in the world is usually for most people the task of a lifetime. But he says, but there are these individuals, individual people, and maybe just individual, perhaps fleeting moments, even I don't know, individuals who kind of come into their own skin, right, you know, all of a sudden. Um, and, and it's that that he, is, that he is kind of pointing us to today. Um, I think I'm going to take this off for a moment. Um, and there's one more kind of lengthy text here, and it will take us into a slightly different domain. So before we do that, I just wanted to sort of ask if anybody wanted to either reflect on that, ask a question. Um, okay, and now I'm, I'm just opening the chat too, so I'll be able to respond to some of that as well. Okay, hi, Julie, go ahead. Unmute, 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 unmute. Okay, um, so I'm, I think this is very interesting because I, I understand that sort of moment of being the right person, the right place, the right time, and just knowing what the moment calls for. And I now see, as we went through this, I sort of see this as like Pincus was a zealot. And so he did this really awful, dramatic thing. But, you know, so the two people who were causing a sin died, but not the whole people were not wiped out. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, this whole idea of this um, angry Old Testament God who was doing a lot of these wiping everyone out, mm -hmm. when went wrong, to, yeah. you know, that, that God could kind of learn from this. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm struggling a little with this idea of whether it's, you know, finding your, I understand, I can relate to the idea of a, a momentary lightning bolt of sort of seeing your purpose in life. I mean, I yeah. tell a personal story about that as, and maybe a lot of people can, but I the pinkest thing is really interesting because maybe he did the right thing in that moment, but he's got a whole, that's one moment in a very long life. And you could imagine lots of, you know, the idea that you somehow fulfill your destiny in that one moment that, but what about all the other moments where maybe you're not acting so good mm -hmm. that you earn your, your place in the world to come. And yeah. that ties in really nicely with that, I, that idea that because he had this tendency towards anger, he was going to be prone to, to, to committing, maybe using his anger inappropriately you know, Correct. Right. and so giving him this idea of peace where he mm -hmm. has some kind of counterbalance to that um, is really important for him to maintain mm -hmm. um, his place in the world to come, or at least yeah. his place in the world as it is coming, you know, that he won't create more problems right. than good from yeah. his, his tendency he has. So I didn't really fit so well, very nicely together for me today. Okay. So you actually just raised more questions for me. Um, <laughs> so thank you for that. I'm going to, I just want to respond to a few things or like lead us um, or use that as an opening for, for something else. Um, so, you know, you, you, you mentioned, right, that this is a, a moment and now he needs to kind of solidify it perhaps lest he become, lest this anger um, you know, draw him into different directions. And I want to just draw our attention to his lineage, right? He's the grandson of Aaron, right? And that's how he is introduced to us. Aaron is known as an Ohev Shalom, the Rodev Shalom. He is a lover of peace and a pursuer of peace. Okay, so this is his grandson. So that's kind of interesting. But another thing about Aaron to note, right, is that he also, right, was part of another kind of communal catastrophe. And that was in the form of the golden calf, right? And um, he didn't spear anybody, which I gather was probably a good thing, but he did enable this catastrophe to actually unfold. And so he took the passion of the people, arguably, and he channeled it into this golden calf. That's you know certainly one way of interpreting um, his, his behavior, right? He said to the people, Mila, 
no, no, sorry, that was somebody else. That was the Levine, come back to that in a second. He said to the people, bring me your gold, right? Which raises all these questions about his culpability in that. But I share this because I think you know your your point or one of your points, Julie, was that right, we want to be forward looking, that there can be an aha moment, you know, a big moment of recognition or transformation. And what God is doing is sort of extending that or saying, like, now let's actually keep you on the right path. I just want to note that this is a story in a long lineage of people contesting with their own passions, basically. And to stay more local, I'll add in that Aaron's, other, so El Azar is one of Aaron's sons, right? But he also had two others who were also pretty passionate people, Nadav and Avihu. And you know what happened to them, right? Oops, they, you know, were blown up, right? Singed in a fire. They were also passionate people and that was their ending. And I'll even say going way further back, they are all in the tribal line of Levi, right? Levi is somebody who um, back in, I forget the, which, exactly which portion, but back in the book of Brasheets, there is one big story of, well, there's more than one, but there's a story of violence that involves Levi, Levi and his brother Shimon. Um, and that is with regard to Dina, their sister. They go and they kill a whole nation, a vulnerable nation. Right? They're all, you know, at home sleeping or maybe they're, they had gotten circumcised, whatever, that's side note, but um, they, they kill a whole population. And what's, it's interesting to follow the line of Levi through the Torah, and you'll see that it's this lineage of people that are struggling too much passion, not enough passion, passion in the right place, passion misconstrued, right? And um, I can't say that it ends per se, but you can see that the Levi line, as opposed to Shimon, who uh, still seems to be quite violent and at the end of the day does not even get blessed by his father, because of that, FYI. But the story of Levi is a story of sublimation, the story of, and, and screwing up all the time, but an attempt at sublimation of, of passion to the point where in the temple, right, they become the, that, that tribe becomes the tribe of the priests, which, you know, one way of understanding that is they're involved in sacrifices, they're involved in, right, it's, violence in a directed sublimated kind of way. Okay, that was a very long digression, but um, thank you for giving me occasion to say it anyway. Um, I have something else to say, but I'll stop. Okay, uh, Barb, go ahead. Yeah, but I, just kind of building on that, I all of our, our heroes, unlike heroes in other religions and other things, they all have faults, just mm -hmm. like us. We all have faults. And, um, but we seek to use our our qualities and you and become work towards peace and um, be the best that we can be. But I one more thing I wanted to say was that you know that Pincus becomes the person he is for this time period. But as things change throughout our lives, we remake ourselves. We reinvent ourselves. We we try to look for those things that we have best and and try to use the other things but life is not one in defining moment mm -hmm. it's many defining mm -hmm. moments. yeah i would agree and this was the spadamet's claim at least was that this was this was one for him but right how static that would be or how much that would define or maybe the point is that yes this is a defining moment but now it needs to be differently defined going forward, right? To tweak it, to refine it, absolutely, um, seems to be the message that kind of God offers. Um, Susie, go ahead. Interesting discussion today, very much so. But, you know, the, the priests are not supposed to be around death at all. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that was something that came obviously later, right, with the Kohanim, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know, right? To me, it's an interesting thing because the law was very, very specific, thou shalt not kill. Mm -hmm. And yet being rewarded for sort mm -hmm. of taking the law into his own hands. Yeah. And I mm -hmm. understand, you know, when you were talking about the lineage of Levi and how they've always acted in this impassioned way, if you want to correct that behavior, though, it's, it, there's really moral difficulty with, with sanctioning it. Okay, mm -hmm. 
you stood up for me, so it's great. I'll allow it this time, but don't do it again. Because mm -hmm. um, the question is, the community, obviously there were so many sins that happened in the desert, right? That, that they were supposed to die off because none of them were going to merit being allowed to go to the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just, I, I'm really struggling with this because I think it's a really difficult aspect of why is it okay in this instance? Mm -hmm. And if someone else would have done that, would it have been permitted or is it mm -hmm. only permitted yeah. in this particular case? Yeah. Okay. So I want to, I want to respond to that. I had a lot of difficulty just this week and or last week, whenever I was writing this, thinking it through, because it, it doesn't sit well with me either. I think that the broader ideas of shlemut and what it means to cultivate wholeness, alignment, right, being in the right place in the right time, figuring out, like discerning one's own kind of mission, very appealing, but hard, but but admittedly hard to um, to kind of put back into the the actual details of this story. Um, I want to. I'm going to share something and I, I hope I'm not, uh, I certainly don't want to like touch off anything like grandly political, but I did find it resonant. Uh, I can't keep straight. I'm so, it's so sad to say, but I can't keep straight all of the shootings, the mass shootings, but I believe it was this week, or Indiana last week. I, I don't even know what day it is in shootings, but um, right. So I think it was Indiana, the mall, right? So there was this like kind of interesting, I mean, it's hard to say about it. interesting, but right there, there's a detail there that differed from the previous ones, right? Um, and just to be clear, right, is that the shooter was shot, right? And so it's giving the right some reasons to think, oh, well, maybe guns are good because look, he shot the shooter, but the left, of course, right, things shouldn't have been shooting to begin with. But that is kind of, dare I say, like it's, it's morally interesting, compelling something right? The shooter, the person who shot the shooter is a hero, culturally, but, wait, but the shooter is the devil. The initial shooter is a devil, and the shooter of the shooter is a hero. So I, I'm really not like in a place to, I, think I can pass judgment, like shooting is bad, but um, <laughs> I think that one's not so controversial to say, but the idea that culturally we, society, right, can see the shooter of the shooter, right, and say, like, that was a good act. That was what needed to happen at that particular moment. If, you, if that individual did it anywhere else to anybody else, right, in any other context, it was decidedly the wrong act. Then he becomes the, the devilish character, right? But in this particular space, there is certainly moral argument for, uh, you know, that, that there was something right about that. Um, it only occurred to me because it's the time of Pinchas to even, you know, read it in that kind of a way. But there was something that I found, you know, like morally provocative, like to, to see that and to, I think that um, it is very, very hard and very, very dangerous to think about sanctioning violence under any circumstances. And then there's that, and it makes me think about, wait, is, is there a situation maybe where that's actually the exact right thing to do? Um, and so I, I'm just gonna sort of put that out there. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, Cantor Louise, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I read this uh, from a, a perspective of having just returned from Israel, mm -hmm. where my daughter's bat mitzvah was, we celebrated oh, okay. Rosh Chodesh Tammuz. And That's speaking awesome. of what's in the news, mm -hmm. um, this oh. was the time that was um, disrupted by, by violence, actually so not physical violence, but um, totally uh, disrupted by mm -hmm. uh, these wow. boys from the Haredi movement. Mm -hmm. um, and zealots, and zealots. they were tearing mm -hmm. up prayer books and throwing them over the edge of the hotel, the egalitarian hotel. And um, it was very, the oh. most hatred and anti-Semitism I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, and um, oh. so, I mean, my granddaughter, after they left, my granddaughter was able to um, 
do, you know, we, we led the service together. She wrote a beautiful, she had written a beautiful poem about women of the wall where she talked mm -hmm. about this violence and oh. wanting to be able to pray. Wow. Um, but she didn't know that she would experience it herself. Yeah, or wow, her wow, wow. Anyway, so that's the background. And then I read, you know, your, your commentary and, and Sfat Emet and all this. And I think about this part, whether these boys are looking at the egalitarian prayer at the wall, mm -hmm. um, women praying and reading from Torah um, with those eyes. Now, these boys were educated to do this. They didn't touch anybody. They were just whistling and, and you know, strong whistles. And mm -hmm. they were, you know, sort of spitting and talking about, um, mm -hmm. you know, telling my elderly Israeli relatives, you should have died from Hitler in the, oh, in, I, 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 burnt I, I, in the um, you know, crematoria. Um, but they weren't, they weren't being done, doing anything for which they could be arrested. But mm -hmm. they were clearly thinking that they were doing the right thing because yeah. they'd been taught to do this. Yes. So I wonder if you could reflect on yeah. this I, mm -hmm. in light of the, the Sure. Thank okay, you so, much. so um, first of all, Mazal Tov. Second of all, I'm so sorry. Um, you know, you hear about some things in the news and it's the first time I'm hearing a, a personal story. Where'd you go on my screen? There you are. Um, and it's a really, really disturbing. So I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, I wanna say that, yes, I imagine in fact that those boys did think that they were exactly, they are, they are sanctifying God's name, right? And from their perspective by, you know, getting, by just disrupting that which they see as taboo or whatever. Um, I think that you know something that I that's um, compelling. It doesn't. This doesn't take away from the biblical reality that this happened and that God said good news or good job. But what's interesting about any of our biblical stories is their reception, right? What we do with them over time. And um, I can't quote you chapter and verse exactly, but um, but I did reference it at least in some of the writing that I did. Right? There's pages of discussion in the Talmud um, that, as I said before, like try to limit and limit and limit and limit and limit this exactly to not get to the place that you sadly described, right? Because it's too easy. If you just sit with a biblical story, there's, right, there's, there's room for disruption and there's room for, for, you know, real physical violence too. And the rabbi saw that and said, oh, no, 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 that's no good. That's no good. Um, we have to actually, you know, make this as um, impossible, essentially, to repeat as possible. So, so yes, I guess you know those individuals. Sadly, you know, they have a lot, a lineage of their own that they can draw from, right? And we do too, right? They might see themselves as zealots, and um, I think hopefully the, the rest of us can see ourselves as inheritors of those who want to limit further and further and further the place of that of that violence. Um, it's just a small little detail. Um, I'm trying to recall the exact phrase I'm not going to, but there's also this small moment that I find that I found interesting in the in the Talmud in this in this regard, where um, Pinchas actually is imagined to have turned to Moses to say, hey, like, what do we do? This is no good. And, um, and Moses turns to Pinchas and says in this pretty abstract way, which I think is itself kind of rich, but we won't go into it. He says something like, he who, um, he who reads the letter should kind of execute its edicts which again, it's, a, it's an odd construction, but essentially what Moses is telling Pinchas is you can do this, but I actually can't. There's something there, and I'm not, I myself, I'm not totally sure of it, which is why I didn't ultimately include it in my, um, in the source sheet today or in the writing, because I, I'm, I'm still sitting with it. But the idea that something can be right for one person, but wrong for the other. And in this case, the other would be Moses himself. Moses saying, for, for me, this wouldn't work. Maybe because he's married to a Medjinite woman, right? He's, he's a little too close to this. 
um, right? Or it's not becoming of him, or there's something not morally right about his involvement. But in this one very specific case, um, he's sort of licensing somebody else. So anyway, that's a long way of saying, I'm so sorry that that happened. And um, there, there's hope to be found in the kind of reinterpretations of, of the Talmud and those that have followed. Um, and I wish those boys had studied that a little bit more. Um, Roberta, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I'm so grateful. Uh, for me, this is the exact discussion that Jews and friends of Torah everywhere need to be happening this week. I, I'm so mm -hmm. grateful. Uh, and I'm really grateful for uh, the woman at Cantor, I didn't get her name, for, for sharing. And I want to encourage her to share. I myself have had very similar experiences uh, in Israel, in Jerusalem, in the West Bank. And um, I guess what uh, is really important, I think, for us to know is um, that there is as much in our tradition saying the teaching here is that this is not what we are supposed to do. Mm -hmm. It's the other. And that we are reclaiming um, the, the streams in our tradition that were the streams written by an oppressed people. We're trying to figure out what does it mean that we're supposed to be different? Mm -hmm. So I want us to be empowered to do that, not apologetic, not to feel like we're making something up. And um, mm -hmm. I just, I, I hope it's okay, Rabbi Aaron, I'm going to mm -hmm. post uh, the link to my blog this week because I cited uh, the Ari, Isaac Luria, the, the Kutzker Rebbe, mm -hmm. uh, Rebbe Jonathan Sachs, all the things they say about this mm -hmm. is so The broken Vav and why Joshua, not Pinchas, because mm -hmm. this is what we're not supposed to do. Correct. Right. Um, it's okay right. that I... Yeah, of course, please, please share. The more, the better. Um, thank you, everyone. Yeah, no, thank you. And also just to, my pointing out that, um, you know, in, in the interpretations that we've read, whether it be the Rashi or the Nitziv or the Svedimet, none of these interpretations sanctions Pinchas's act, right? Whether it's Rashi saying, Shetahelo Brichalum, right? Okay, this wasn't the right way to to do things so it should become to you a peaceful covenant, right? Or then it's even similarly saying, we got to quiet down that emotional interior experience because it will only yield more violence and that's no good. Or the Svat Emet who, yes, does give a way to kind of appreciate um, the act unto itself, but by um, denuding it essentially of, of violence, which you know may or may not resonate for all of us as a kind of genuine interpretation maybe, um, but extract from it lessons that I hope at least are, are resonant. Um, and that is this, this, the importance of the power of these moments of shlemut in our, in our lives. So thank you for that. Um, I wanna call the next person who goes by owner, <laughs> but I don't know your name. Someone has their hand up, but it says owner. Yeah, I have my hand up here. Yeah, go, go. Um, so uh, thank you, Rabbi. What's your this. name? My name's Manda. Hi. Oh, it's okay. his owner. I'm sorry. I don't yeah. know <laughs> My name's Manda. Um, thank you for this discussion. It's excellent. Um, and when you were talking, I thought of I want to go back to in our own country to January 6th uh, of something that really upset me there, where mm -hmm. a woman is breaching the walls of the Capitol and is shot dead. I'm not even sure she had a gun. And when I protested about that i was told well if she hadn't been shot there might have been more there might have been mm -hmm. more lives lost mm -hmm. and um and that's sort of what god is saying to pinkus if you hadn't mm -hmm. done this more lives would be lost but that doesn't sit right with me mm -hmm. either it, yeah how <laughs> I hear that. So I want to I want to highlight something about the story that we haven't been talking so much about, um, and that is, in addition to saying you have this breach alone, right? God says to Pinchas, "You Pinchas did something for me, God. You quieted me. You stopped me from my own worst uh, 
instincts, basically, or impulses. It's probably a better word there, right? And there's something I think very, very, very powerful there. So I, I, I hear the, the question or the critique about the one for the many, and I want to sort of just shift that a little bit, that it's not a numbers game, but it's actually this kind of deep lesson about how humanity can actually teach God. And I think that there's a, a kind of series of stories that we have that involve break breakdown moments that serve to blunt God's own worst instincts. And another example that comes to mind for me of this, um, which was referenced before when we were talking about um, the lineage of Pinchas and Aaron, right? And that is the, the golden calf. So in that instance of the golden calf, right? That's another time where God says to Moses, like, let's get rid of these people. Like enough with this, get rid of all of them, right? And on the one hand, there's a verbal response where Moshe says, like, I want no part of that. God says, we'll just start over you and me, you know, we'll start over this whole project. And Moses says, I don't want to be a part of that thing. So don't include me in that Torah of yours, then wipe out my name, he says. But there's also a physical act, and that is a physical act of breaking, and that is the breaking of the tablets. And um, though this is surely my own editorializing, um, I think one, one way to kind of read that is again, a, a kind of violent act, yes, recognizing that it's an object and not and not a person, but it's a very holy object um, and it's, it's not done lightly, right? But there's a smashing that takes place and that seems to stop God in a way, right? Or stop this devolution into kind of chaos. And so, um, you know, I, I wonder if just another way to, to look at this is through that lens of what are those two things. One, how do sometimes explosive moments help us, which in and of themselves are not great, but they actually help us recalibrate, right? Sometimes an explosion, right? Throwing, whether it's like physical, an act that, you know, you throw something or you see something thrown and smashed and then causes you to just like, you know, step back a little bit or an emotional experience of like great anger, let's say, right, that also is not comfortable, is the opposite of shalom, it's not peaceful, this is not about serenity, right, but it actually, in its, in its violence, and here I'm talking about emotional violence now, right, actually causes us to just, whoa, recalibrating, thing like that GPS line, you know, recalibrating, you have gone off course, recalibrating, we need to start over now. So that's one dimension of it, and one way to sort of um, understand this. And then also just really wanting to add in that second dimension of um, human beings teaching, teaching God a lesson in a way. I recognize that this is maybe not such a, an easy example of that, um, but it is noteworthy to me that we are standing at like, we're in the third to the last uh, chapter, not chapter, portion of the book of, of Bamibar, the book of uh, Numbers. And um, once we start the book of Devarim, the last book of the Torah, right, a lot of you know, that, that book is known as Mishnah Torah or the second telling or the like highlights reel. And it, in some ways is true, and in other ways there is some new material, but in any case, it seems to be mostly a recap, right? It's Moses's last words. They're just about, you know, he's about to die and he's sort of going through all that happened to them. So interesting then to think about the book of Bamidbar is in certain sense, like the end of the events of the Torah. Um, and if that's the case, what's Pinchas doing there? Again, I recognize he's not the end, he's third to last, but um, it's like a big crescendo moment just before the story itself, again, goes into that, um, you know, highlights reel that I mentioned. And I, I wonder, I just wonder whether part of, like, what would it mean to kind of end the Torah on that line or end the Torah on this message that um, sometimes human beings need to kind of arrest things, right, stop things from progressing and like, teach God in a way who God needs to be in the world. And I'll say one more thing about that. Um, 
Susie Lambert just says broken Luchot. So I want to just come back to that. Um, so even if you don't like my reading of Bamidbar as being like the last book of the of the Torah, I also just want to mention that in the actual last book of the Torah, of Devarim, which will start in two weeks' time, um, the last verse that I cannot quote to you offhand, but I will tell you the Rashi on that last verse, the last verse references all the things that Moses did Israel, in the eyes of all the people. And you might think, well, Moses did a whole lot of things in front of the eyes of people, he split seas, you know, maybe got the, you know, went to Mount Sinai, like a whole lot of things he did in front of the people. But Rashi, who's quoting Midrash there, says that Ine B'nei Israel is a reference to the breaking of the tablets. And not only the breaking of the tablets, but specifically, um, and I don't know if I've shared this here, and if I haven't, then I'm surprised because I share this all the time. It's one of my favorite lines. Reish Lakish says in the Talmud about the breaking of the tablets, Yashir Koach Shashibarta. Well done, Moses. You did a good thing. So imagine that, right? What is the last line, the very last line of the entire Torah? as understood by, you know, the Midrash, cited by Rashi, is Yashar Koach Sheshi Barta. Well done that you, Moshe, intervened. You did something, yes, very big, and as I said, like explosive, you did something, and in so doing, you actually um, reset my God's relationship with um, with the people, and that was is profoundly important. So, Okay, I've got a little carried away there. I'm sorry. Um, but I do think that that the dynamic, right, and the way that Pinchas is also a reset, Moshe is a reset. There are these moments where um, the kind of, you know, story that we, that we inherit or the, and the kind of theology that we inherit, right, is not of a, you know, of a vertical, a vertical force that kind of comes down, but it's actually this, this, you know, reciprocal relationship of human beings kind of shaping and um, massaging in a way like who and what God needs to be in the world. That's very, I think, profound, provocative, heretical for some, but um, I think actually kind of a very deep message that is embedded here. Okay, I will stop. I'm sorry. Um, Martha, go ahead. Uh, the whole time we've been talking, I can't get out of my head about the assassination of um, Prime Minister mm. Rabin oh, and, okay. and um, how mm. th some of the backstory that I read at the time was he was egged on. I don't even remember who the assassin was, so I'm glad I don't Miguel remember. Amir, yeah. Yeah, that he, was egg that he was egged on by the way the Torah was Mm -hmm. He too was going to be a hero, a princess who yep. was going mm -hmm. to intervene. Yep. And, mm -hmm. you know, there might be all that Talmudic uh, uh, yep. teachings to set limits, but I, he was receiving it from sure. his esteemed rabbis. And yep. Yep. hundred oh. percent. I can't, I can't, you know, redeem Pinchas and certainly God forbid would never redeem me Um And you're absolutely right that he uh, was reputedly being taught these ideas, particularly Dean Rodef, which is the idea that um, if some, what's called self, what we would call self-defense, if somebody's coming after you, you can shoot them or you can harm them. Um, and he sort of, you know, went through a whole process of legal kind of casuistry to, to, to determine that in fact, right, Rabin was a, a Rodef or was someone who was coming to get us, him, the Jewish people, the land of Israel, whatever. Um, so I don't agree. There's no answer. Like, yeah, that's awful. Like, yes, that's a misuse of, um, of these. And, uh, and again, I'll say what I, what I said to, back to, uh, Louise, right. Which is unquestionably these texts, these texts are there. These texts are in certain ways quite ugly and they can be used and deployed by people who definitely think that they are standing on firm ground. And then I want to you know, really raise up, right? As uh, Roberta said, and maybe you'll read whatever she wrote about it too, right? That, um, you know, raise up the voices that really, really, really see this as um, as an affront, as, or a once in a lifetime, or just, you know, shrinking it down to the to the place where nobody, neither Yigal Amir nor hecklers at the coat cell or anybody else should um, feel that they have solid grounding. I, ri I understand that, all religious traditions, and we certainly have a whole lot of 
hard, difficult, even hateful material. And we have to contend with that. We do. And I'm proud to say that we do also have right, a very robust lineage of, of interpretive tradition um, that tries to mitigate against that. Um, but it it does acknowledge the the lived reality that right, religious violence is is real, and we all unfortunately still see it. Um, and maybe our response should be right to lead breach shalom, like to all those who speak in the name of religion with violence. Our response is let this be a breach shalom. Please let it be a covenant of peace only, and not one and not one of violence. Um, amen, amen to that. Yeah, amen. All right, so we're gonna stop there. If any of you um, are inclined to read the last source, it's rather wacky, um, and uh, feel free to reach out to me if you want to discuss it. It's it's a it's just a funny uh, Talmudic tale, and it's the source for the idea of um, acquiring one's world in a single moment, and it comes about in a in a rather unique way. Um, I will leave it at that. And um, I hope that I will see you all next week. Um, wishing you peace. And I'm going to put my email. Sorry, someone just asked for it before you all go. If you're interested.